So the dog and I are running around down here at Newtown on this hockey pitch and it's really green. You can tell that. Grass is really good. And that's the clue. That's the trick. That's the whole point of Newtown is that the soil's really rich here and it's a really good spot for growing crops, for farming. And that's what the free settlers were doing. Now, how did they know it would be good for farming? Well, they had to guess. And what they would have done was look around and see what else was growing here. Now, they know the rivulet was there, of course. That was always going to help having fresh water. But they must have done some investigation. Some investigation that gave them a clue. Now, after the failure over at Risden Cove on the other side of the river, Collins really wanted to make a go of things. Now, if I had to guess, even before he got here, he'd maybe done some study. So as soon as he arrived, he knew that this is where people were going to be living. This map from 1802 was cause for alarm. It was one of the first to depict a body of water separating the island from the mainland. It was only in 1798 that Bass and Flinders circumnavigated Van Diemen's Land. In doing so, it threw into doubt if, by European standards, the English actually had rights to Van Diemen's Land. Fearful that the French, who had in fact been visiting the island, might lay claim to the island, the 23-year-old John Bowen was sent south to establish a settlement. It's worth mentioning his age, as it's a reminder of just how juvenile most of the first Europeans were when they showed up. John Bowen's settlement at Risdon Cove failed, but he succeeded in securing the island for England. This map was made by English officer John Hayes, unaware that the area had already been charted by French explorer Bruni Don Dracastro. Just two months earlier, he ended up renaming a number of the places, such as the Derwent River itself. He also gave modern-day Newtown Bay the name Stainforce Cove, and the land beyond that he called King George's Plains, an area that he pointed out as having rich alluvial soil. When Collins arrived, he was coming off his own failed settlement at Port Phillip Bay. Collins is notorious for not recording an account of his career, but he must have known about Hay's opinion of the potential farming land. He also knew the problems caused by having free settlers and convicts mixing, which is why he took the convicts away to found Hobart, while leaving the free settlers to establish Newtown. Ten 100-acre land grants were initially issued, four on the south side of the rivulet and six on the north. The blocks all had to have water rivulet frontage, which led to the unusual shapes, especially on the north side, where they fan out. Many of those borders became roads, and the impact is still felt today when you drive around the area. In the beginning, Van Diemen's land was designed differently. To begin with, it was divided into two counties at the 42nd parallel. The north of the island was named Cornwall, and the south was called Buckingham. In 1834, surveyors came along. They turned the two counties into 18 small counties. And by chance, the area of modern-day Newtown fell into what was called Buckingham. That system has all been abolished now, but that name continues in two very old sports clubs, the Buckingham Rowing Club and the Buckingham Bowling Club. In the beginning, the area of Newtown was not officially defined but effectively extended all the way from today's North Hobart to Derwent Park, including the Vaughan suburbs of Mount Stewart, Lena Valley, Moona and Lutana. Lena, Moona and Lutana are all Aboriginal names. Robert Knopwood would often travel from Hobart on his horse or on foot to the settlement at Newtown, wandering off the regular paths into the bush on either side. According to accounts, he never came across any Aboriginal people, but he did find their huts. It's sketchy in the extreme. The Newtown Town Board was formed in 1892. At the time, Newtown ranked third in the colony for population, but it had no public buildings. Designed in the academic classical style by Thomas Searell, the Newtown Council Chambers opened in 1897. In 1920, what was then the new town council was amalgamated into Greater Hobart. Doing so was a friction point. There was pushback. It's the type of friction that still continues today, 
as councils in Tasmania continue to modernise and attempt to amalgamate. But change is inevitable. As much as anything, new transport technology meant that Newtown was, in every practical way, no longer its own town, separate from Hobart. The top of Newtown Road and the start of Augusta Road used to be the home of a service station. Today, that spot belongs to a bottle shop and a small supermarket. The intersection to this day has very wide openings. That exists because of legacy, because in the past, one of the things it had to accommodate was the turning of trams. Here is the opening of the Augusta Road Line in 1922. The arrival of trams quickly led to the suburbanisation of the area. This is a 1927 map of Hobart. The red marks indicate where the tram lines were. All the train lines were removed in 1960, and today there are almost no clues that they were ever here. The same cannot be said for other things. So we're walking down here with the Brooker Highway just there. Come on, dog. And the Brooker Highway is like a lot of things in Newtown, like the high tension power lines or the rivulet or the train line, in that it, it interrupts the flow of Newtown. If it wasn't here, things would be different. That sort of move more smoothly. Come on dog. But it is here and that sort of as much as anything shapes the way that Newtown is. Here is a satellite image of Newtown today. In yellow we see the flannel curtain high tension power lines. In blue is the rivulet that mostly gets ignored. In red we have the extinct train line and in magenta is the Brooker Highway. Lines across Newtown carving the place up like monsters. In the vortex of this spaghetti of infrastructure some of the original homes of free settlers still stand. This painting from 1750 by Thomas Gainsborough is called Mr and Mrs Andrews. The work is an unusual combination of two common types of painting from the period. A double portrait here, the recently married Robert and Francis Andrews, and of a landscape here, the English countryside. The couple are members of the land-owning upper class. It was the landed gentry that free settlers in Newtown were trying to escape. In early 19th century England, it was exceptionally hard to acquire land if you weren't already born into it. If free settlers could make their way to Van Diemen's land, they'd be given free real estate and access to free labour through the convict system. This 1835 painting, titled My Harvest Home, was painted by John Glover. It had been given 2,560 acres of land. The men working in the image are indeed convicts. Their labour was his return. This painting was sent back to England and used as propaganda to encourage other free settlers to travel to Van Diemen's land. The image is dreamlike, and to the naive eye, the place looks like Arcadia. But within a few decades, free settlers in Van Diemen's land found that the dream was over, that all the decent grazing land for farming had been granted away. Everybody was all out of moves. But in this building, Swanson House, owned by Charles Swanston, he met with other people to plan the expedition that led to the mainland settlement of Victoria. Swanson's involvement in the enterprise resulted in one of Melbourne's main roads being named after him, Swanston Street. On the corner of Creek Road and Newtown Road, there is a traffic signal box. Painted by Lindy Bevan with the assistance of Jilly Bowie is the image of an oasis turned mirage. The building that was once perhaps the most prominent in Newtown today is seen by almost nobody. So we're down here on the creek, on the rivulet. 
It's very picturesque. There's a bit of a hiss in the background that's coming from the light industry that's going over there. This white building behind us is one of the oldest buildings in the whole country actually and it's one of the original buildings that was put up when Newtown was settled. It's called Pitt Farm and the farming land has since been sold off and that's what you get off a lot in Moona. So this side of the creek is technically Moona now and the other side, well that's Newtown. But back in the day, this was all Newtown. It's an interesting building and we're kind of lucky it's still here. You can't see it from the main road because of all the warehouses that have been put up. But if you come to the correct spot on the rivulet, you'd be able to get just close enough to it without being invasive and it gives you a very pleasant feeling. It gives you a, a vibe that makes you sort of feel almost like you were back in the past, even though that's probably all just a stupid illusion. Pitt Farm is a double story brick colonial farmhouse built circa 1810. Richard Pitt had arrived with David Collins in 1804. The building was almost destroyed by fire in 2007. The owners have been at great pains to restore the property. Pitt was one of the few early settlers to have any prior experience farming, a reminder that not only were the people that arrived in Newtown very young, they were very inexperienced. In his day, he would have been able to look out his window and see the Newtown rivulet pouring into Newtown Bay. The new town that belonged to the early free settlers and the Aboriginal people before them is unrecognisable today. Those people would have to look up to the mountain to feel anything familiar. But of all the things that would be most alien to them, they'd have to wait until the sun had slipped below the horizon. In the early 1900s, there was an ambition to bring electricity to every Tasmanian farm house and business. No other state or territory at the time had a public community-wide energy generating enterprise and within 20 years electricity had largely replaced kerosene lamps, candles and steam engines. If those earlier Tasmanians could see their homes now from above they'd not only see that the trees are gone and that the farmland that replaced those trees is gone. Beneath their feet, astroturf, fake grass, flooded with false light, and the bush and the ocean beyond, filled with invention. <laughs> 